Hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture. I hope that you had uh, the chance to go through the last lecture and uh, we will uh, briefly look at what we did uh, last time before we start uh, a new topic today. The last lecture we had uh, discussed uh, Tamao Fleming oxidation which uh, is basically a conversion of uh, the chiral uh, or even a chiral, but chiral is more important. If you have a chiral uh, silicon bonded uh, compound such as this here I have shown uh, and if this is treated under the Mau condition, then we get the corresponding alcohol that means the carbon silicon bond is broken and carbon hydroxy. Uh, bond is formed uh, and this condition is uh, that we discussed last time in detail. In Tamao's condition we have three different types of conditions. On the other hand uh, the Fleming oxidation uh, involves uh, the two types of possibilities as we discussed uh, one is uh, a two pot uh, reaction and the other one is one pot uh, operation or, or reaction. In both the cases in the Tamao's case as well as Fleming oxidation case eventually we get the same product as retention of configuration of the hydroxy group uh, from the silicon bonded uh, group that we started with. So uh, and both are important and uh, in a similar fashion when we had the alkenyl uh, silane like this we discussed uh, towards the end. Uh, that if we have uh, neutral or basic condition like this and if it is a disubstituted olefin then we can get the corresponding aldehyde or if it is under acidic condition like this then we can get the corresponding acid provided that the silicon has substitutions like this. On the other hand uh, when it is a tri-substituted uh, silicon containing alkenyl molecule then either whether it is acidic or neutral or basic condition we get only the corresponding ketone because there is no chance of getting any acid. And as we discussed uh, that we have acidic conditions in which uh, we have hydrogen peroxide, acetic anhydride and this uh, fluorine source and DMF at room temperature neutral is uh, also the same except acetic anhydride is not there and of course you heat from room temperature to 60 degrees and the basic condition requires potassium carbonate in methanol and 60 degrees temperature. So this is how the uh, uh, Tamao Fleming oxidation is utilized and uh, it is a very important reaction as we discussed and we saw some applications. Now one more example that I had shown last time was uh, this uh, silicon uh, molecule, uh, this molecule containing silicon group and the fluoride uh, here at this position and I showed that it forms a corresponding uh, hydroxy group with the intermediacy of uh, uh, this kind which uh, essentially uh, was shown by Knolker, a German scientist Knolker whose reference I have given here in uh, Senlet 1995. He actually isolated when he did the work he actually isolated the corresponding uh, methoxy or hydroxy group here. So this particular molecule was isolated by Knolker during the reaction of uh, converting this particular silicon containing uh, molecule to the corresponding hydroxy molecule and showed. So the work by Knolker showed that the intermediate methoxy silane when R is methyl or silanol when R is hydrogen could be isolated during the oxidation of the fluorosilane under Tamao's basic condition. So this is the condition under which they isolated. Now it is very clear that when they did prepare the alkoxy and the hydroxy silanes 
these molecules separately not under these conditions and uh, can then subjected these, these molecules under the same conditions of the Mao they did indeed get the hydroxy compound. So, it is very clear that under these conditions at least these the Tamau Kumada oxidation proceeds to the intermediacy of the methoxysilane and the silanol at least in these conditions or for this particular molecule. It is very clear that the intermediate would be something like this starting from this particular intermediate where there is an OR or OH the hydrogen peroxide would attack and eventually one would get something like this which finally will give the product of this type. So, this uh, is a very clear indication of how the Tamau oxidation uh, can proceed and there is a very clear evidence that some intermediates of this kind can be isolated. We start now with uh, oxidations of a different kind which is uh, oxidations with dimethyl dioxirane. As you can see the name dimethyl dioxirane. So, this is the structure of the dimethyl dioxirane. So, it is a 3 membered cyclic peroxide as you can see there is a peroxide bond and since it is uh, a, um, a 3 member ring with 2 oxygens obviously it is a very reactive substrate it is a very reactive reagent and uh, uh, it uh, reacts readily uh, with all kinds of double bonds but obviously it would react um, much faster with electron rich double bonds. As we go along we will see how the reactivity of this dimethyl dioxirane can uh, be uh, understood. How do we make this? It is very uh, easy to prepare uh, into on paper, but it is not that easy to prepare in the laboratory that is because the boiling point of this uh, DMDO which is dimethyl dioxirane is uh, minus 20 degrees that means it is a very low boiling. Uh, compound and it can be easily prepared from acetone and the oxone which we discussed about oxone last time. Oxone is nothing but uh, potassium monoperoxy uh, sulphate uh, along with uh, potassium hydrogen sulphate and potassium sulphate, but this is the main oxidant and uh, it is a, a, a very uh, useful oxidizing agent. Now, when acetone reacts with uh, this oxone you get the corresponding DMDO which has to be distilled out very carefully at low temperature with all protections so that the, the molecule the DMDO does not escape out. Now, uh, there are several uh, ways by which this reaction can be done. Uh, you can either isolate this DMDO uh, by distilling and can uh, cooling it at low temperature so that you can isolate this DMDO and then you carry out the reaction. So, you can have an isolated way of doing it or you can also do it in situ. In situ means inside the reaction we put acetone and also oxone and as soon as the DMDO is formed the DMDO reacts with the olefin. Uh, and the epox uh, epoxidation occurs. So, basically olefins react with this DMDO to form the uh, corresponding epoxide. Now, the side product as you can see what once one oxygen of the DMDO is transferred to the olefin the side product is nothing but acetone. So, it is a very uh, useful way of uh, regenerating the starting ketone that means you are starting ketone is acetone that reacts with uh, oxone forms DMDO and in if that uh, DMDO reacts with the olefin you get the corresponding epoxide and acetone back. In, it means that we can start with a small amount of acetone and a large amount of oxone and as soon as the reaction of olefin occurs with the DMDO acetone is back and that acetone again reacts with the with the oxone to prepare to form DMDO and then reaction continues. Now, this is a very general way of uh, reacting. So, various ketones of different kind have been found to react with this oxone 
to form the corresponding dioxidin. So that means we can here write a general way of uh, representing that we have a ketone which is an acyclic ketone right now can form the corresponding dioxidin. So irrespective of what uh, our groups are you can have the corresponding dioxidin. In a similar fashion you can also have corresponding uh, cyclic uh, ketone that can give the uh, dioxidin of this type. So uh, this advantage of this is that we can prepare uh, the dioxidin uh, from a chiral ketone. So if the ketone is chiral that means optically active then uh, we can have a small amount of or a catalytic amount of ketone we can use it and react with the dimethyl to, to react with uh, oxone and then we epoxidation is expected to take place because the chiral ketone, so any chiral ketone will give the corresponding chiral dioxidin. So supposing if you have a R group here and here is R1 group and your ketone is like this and one of these is having a chiral center here. So once the corresponding uh, dioxidin is formed which contains now elements of uh, chirality here in terms of R group here. So when this transfer the, uh, the oxygen to the corresponding olefin then one can expect that the epoxide that is going to form would be optically active. So I will show the, uh, so you have two asymmetric centers here and if these two groups are different of course then you will have chiral epoxide. I will show you the examples later on. So now epoxidation can take place but since uh, if we take a chiral ketone and uh, if uh, we have to use one equivalent of uh, uh, chiral ketone then it is not going to be a very easy process, it is not going to be a cheap process and therefore it is nice to see that the, the after the transfer of the epoxide, uh, after the transfer of the oxygen to the double bond and when the epoxide forms the ketone which is now in this present case it will be chiral that chiral ketone can be recovered and will be reused during the in situ. In situ means inside the reaction it will continue to keep on generating the chiral dioxidin. Now this particular dimethyl dioxidin or any dioxidin is very reactive because of uh, the main reason that it is a three member ring with two oxygens and therefore it is a very strained ring and transfers the oxygen very readily. And that is the reason why there are some limitations such as uh, amines and sulphides also react uh, with uh, the dimethyl dioxidin even more rapidly than with the double bond obviously because we have a lone pair of electrons on the amine as well as on sulphides. But since this is a metal free protocol it is useful and, and people use it. Uh, the only disadvantage of this uh, uh, use of this dimethyl dioxidine is that it is um, a bit uh, difficult to handle because of the low boiling nature and also uh, in some instances it has been found that it is uh, in explosive. So it can explode if the reaction is uh, not carried out at appropriate temperature. Uh, but then the, the formation of the in situ uh, method for dimethyl dioxidin or any other dioxidin is uh, very useful and can avoid the isolation of the corresponding dioxidin. Commonly used uh, dioxidins are DMDO that is dimethyl dioxidin and also this um, uh, methyl trifluoromethyl dioxidin. So you have a methyl and the trifluoromethyl dioxidin. These are the two which are used uh, uh, very often uh, of course uh, both by uh, in situ preparation and of course this can be easily isolated. This will be little difficult to isolate but then in situ preparation would be relatively easy. So for the in situ preparation in this case you will have to take uh, this ketone which is uh, relatively easy to 
handle. In this case of course you will have the acetone. So both the cases we can easily uh, do the in situ preparation. Now what is the mechanism? The mechanism is via a spiro transition state. So as you can see here we have the dimethyl dioxirane which is transferring its oxygen to the uh, olefin which is present here and the transition state it's a kind of a spiro transition state which is the this is the spiro center in the middle and the transition state involves transfer of the oxygen uh, in a more or less like a concerted process. So if we start with a trans double bond we get the corresponding epoxide we retaining the stereochemistry of the double bond. For example uh, one can see that if we start with a, a molecule like this which is a racemic molecule which has an isopropyl group as a substituent on the top when the reaction is done what is found is that this particular epoxide where the isopropyl group and the epoxide group are opposite to each other that forms as a major product uh, with 78 percent yield. On the other hand the cis product where the epoxide and the isopropyl group are cis to each other it forms uh, in a major minor way. So it is very clear that the product is formed from less hindered side. The major product is formed from the less hindered side. Of course here we are talking about the relative stereochemistry. We are not talking about the absolute stereochemistry because we have started with a racemic compound. Now what do we do? to make the molecule that is the epoxide as chiral. What are the ways by which we can use this uh, oxidioxirane to get uh, epoxides which are chiral. There are two uh, ways by which one can do it. For example, uh, if this is the olefin that is taken and if we want to convert into the corresponding epoxide in a chiral fashion here and here what uh, has been utilized is uh, manganese selen complex. This is the manganese selen complex which was reacted with DM DMDO to form this uh, reagent uh, in, in the reaction. That means if we begin with this man manganese selen complex and react with DMDO in the reaction uh, it forms the corresponding uh, manganese uh, this oxygen double bond here based reagent which then transfers the uh, oxygen to the olefin uh, to form this particular epoxide. This is something that we will discuss little more in detail later on when we, we do the asymmetric uh, epoxidation. So this is called Katsuki Jacobson uh, epoxidation and uh, I have mentioned here mainly because it utilizes uh, DMDO in the reaction. Of course you can also use some other oxidizing agent but again advantage of using DMDO uh, is that the side product is uh, of ketone that is uh, acetone. Now this is one way of uh, uh, doing the epoxidation in a chiral fashion. What is the other way of doing uh, chiral epoxidation is you can start with a chiral ketone. So, as I discussed earlier the chiral ketone can be utilized in a small amount like for example in this case conversion of this uh, uh, stilbene to the corresponding uh, stilbene oxide in 97 percent enantiomeric excess under these conditions uh, where the chiral ketone is used which is only 30 mole percent. Various kinds of chiral ketones have been utilized for example this is one of the chiral ketones which has the CF3 methoxy phenyl and uh, this particular methyl ketone or this type of ketone where uh, the chirality comes from the corresponding atrop isomerism. So this is the ketone which is uh, going to be reacting with the oxone to form the corresponding chiral dioxirane. But more than these is the uh, Shee's catalyst which is utilized which is uh, reported by Y. Xi in the United States. 
and that can be easily prepared from the D fructose. As you can see here the top ones which I have shown here are the ketones which are not sterically hindered. They are chiral, they are uh, optically pure but they are not sterically hindered. On the other hand if we take the D fructose which can look somewhat like this and can be converted to the corresponding ketone uh, by the oxidation of the this hydroxy group uh, after the protection of these two hydroxy groups as the corresponding acetonides you can oxidize the hydroxy group into the corresponding ketone. And this ketone as you can see is uh, flanked by two bulky groups here. Uh, the two bulky groups are present here this part and, and this part. So therefore if the dioxirane is formed in the middle we can expect a fairly good amount of uh, uh, stereo selectivity because of the steric hindrance. For the in situ epoxidation a two phase system is used uh, as this uh, potassium monoperoxy sulphate is uh, not soluble in organic solvent. So we can use water dichloromethane or something of that sort. Uh, hence substrates which are uh, or the products which are sensitive to hydrolysis cannot survive under these conditions. So if we do the in situ epoxidation inside the reaction we take the ketone and um, add oxone and if you are starting uh, olefin or the epoxide which is formed is sensitive to hydrolysis then obviously it cannot survive under these conditions. So there are advantages of using an in situ epoxidation but there is also a somewhat disadvantage. Both electron rich and electron deficient alkenes uh, undergo epoxidation but as one can expect the electron rich alkenes would react faster. Electron deficient epoxides also exhibit uh, um, enhanced hydrolytic stability. That means although the electron deficient uh, alkenes would undergo epoxidation uh, somewhat slower than that of electron rich alkenes, but the products formed uh, with electron deficient substituents and the corresponding epoxide which is formed would obviously not undergo uh, easy hydrolysis. Say for example if you have an electron withdrawing group here uh, on the, uh, the epoxide and you have another electron withdrawing group here obviously this formation would be somewhat slow. But then the during the hydrolysis uh, this bond would not easily be breaking because we will be generating here a some positive charge and that would be next to the electron withdrawing group. So there is a advantage of hydrolytic stability once the epoxide is formed after the um, epoxidation of electron deficient olefins has occurred. Now electron deficient olefins as I mentioned take longer time as uh, you can see here this is an electron deficient olefin it gives 100 percent of the epoxide but then it has taken 57 hours uh, time. So it does not really matter the time but then at least it is uh, uh, not unstable molecule because of hydrolytic stability and as you can see that the yield is 100 percent. Now one can also use uh, uh, quite sensitive uh, substrates such as this sugar derived uh, olefin which can react with the DMDO and at 0 degrees centigrade in dichloromethane this is the reaction after isolating the DMDO that it leads to 99 percent of this epoxide. Since uh, these groups are here or particularly this group is beta oriented here the uh, epoxide uh, attacks or epoxide forms from the alpha side. So you can see here 20 is to 1 is the alpha beta ratio. But then this epoxide is a very sensitive epoxide because the lone pair of electron can easily open 
the epoxide here. So therefore, uh, there should not be uh, any uh, possibility of uh, cleavage of the epoxy epoxide compound. But you can make use of uh, this uh, epoxide uh, which is uh, formed from an olefin which is electron rich and uh, it can be hydrolyzed to the corresponding hydroxy ketone. Say for example, if you start with uh, an enol silyl ether which is an electron rich double bond and if we do the reaction at uh, uh, minus 40 degrees with DMDO in acetone dichloromethane reaction mixture within 3 hours this particular epoxide is formed and as one can imagine that H3O plus that the under acidic conditions this epoxide can easily open the protonation would occur here and then the uh, bond will break and eventually we would get the hydroxy ketone. So you can get alpha hydroxy ketone readily uh, if you start with enol silyl ether. So sensitive epoxide prepare since DMDO works under mild neutral conditions without any nucleophilic component. So this is the sensitive epoxide which is formed and since there is only acetone as a side product therefore there is no nucleophile present or an under neutral conditions the epoxide does not open. When olefin is bound both to electron withdrawing group as well as electron donating group the uh, olefin more like more or less like behaves like the former that is the electron withdrawing group and generally takes long time with some occasional heating. We may have to heat in some cases obviously people try to avoid as much as possible. However, as we discussed earlier the products are relatively stable to hydrolysis. Now one example is somewhat like this here you have an electron withdrawing olefin here as well as you have donation of electrons from this side. When the reaction is occurred uh, in an in situ fashion now you can see here the uh, starting ketone is taken as trifluoromethyl methyl ketone and this is mainly because if the epoxide uh, uh, is to be formed you need to have a very reactive dimethyl di or dioxirane and since there are there is an electron withdrawing CF3 group present here. The, the reactivity of this dioxidine is very high. Therefore, now if this particular starting olefin has an electron withdrawing group and uh, therefore the nucleophilicity of the double bond is somewhat less than electron rich olefin. Therefore, you increase the uh, electrophilicity of the dioxidine that you have uh, you are going to use and therefore if one makes the dioxidine of this type which has a CF3 group attached here the uh, oxygen can easily be transferred and that is the reason why it just takes say 1.25 hours to form the corresponding epoxide. So basically you have to have a balance between um, the reactivity of the olefin as well as the reactivity of the dioxidine that is uh, used under the conditions. So this is how one can uh, carry out various kinds of uh, uh, reactions of different olefins that can uh, lead to the corresponding epoxide formation. Now if we have a substrate which uh, has both electron rich and electron uh, deficient olefins such as here like this is an electron rich and this is an electron deficient olefin obviously the electron rich would react uh, faster than the electron deficient therefore the epoxide forms uh, from the uh, this end of the double molecule. And uh, one can also see that in its application wise that is somewhat complicated example this tricyclic molecule which has an electron deficient olefin here reacts to form the corresponding epoxide. Now you can see the formation of the epoxide is taking from the beta side because the groups which are present here they are all alpha oriented. So due to steric hindrance 
the formation of the epoxide occurs from the beta side. So we will stop it at this uh, stage today and then uh, take up the um, other examples or other applications of the uh, dimethyl dioxirane and the mechanism how does it happen in the next class. So uh, until then you can go through these um, uh, things which I have discussed today, uh, thank you.